Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone on the call. Uh, it's a delight to be with you and uh, even more so a delight to be able to look on the screen and, and recognize friends from different parts of the world that I've had an opportunity to already meet and now reconnect with and some new friends, obviously, by the end of this call that, uh, that will have a special bond as well. So today I, um, I wanted to be able to share with you sort of where we're at um, in Rotary at this moment in time and to be able to, of course, uh, take your questions. And so for the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you some of what I think are the most exciting things that are going on in the Rotary world. And then we'll turn it over to the uh, second half of the program and open up the floor to anything that you would like to ask about. I'm, uh, I'm certainly willing and prepared to answer any kinds of questions that you have about anything large or small. Um, regarding our great organization. So first and foremost, let me say thank you to each and every one of you for being a leader in our organization. And I, and I mean that sincerely. Everyone in our organization is a leader in some capacity in our community, in our, in our country, in our, in our own organization. And so it's, uh, it's truly a pleasure to be with you. So we're in historic and unprecedented times in our organization's history. You know, we, we finished in, in last April a council on legislation, our governing body of Rotary, which happens every three years. And we had some groundbreaking changes that came to the forefront. First and foremost, and I think probably the most important, is the unprecedented flexibility that clubs now have to do business in a different kind of way, the way that, that works best for them. And this doesn't necessarily apply to you as an e-club, um, but one of the big changes that came across is that e-clubs are now considered regular Rotary clubs. And isn't that good news? Because um, we certainly can understand that, that meeting virtually is, is just as important as meeting face-to-face. -face. And that really speaks to something that we're talking about right now, and that's not about necessarily being a Rotarian, but understanding the Rotary experience. Because you're having a wonderful Rotary experience, but you don't have to be within four specific walls in another group, uh, in a room with another group of people to do good in the world. And so you are proof positive that, of that tonight. And this is my second opportunity to sit in on an e-club meeting. And I know it won't be my last. This is... Um, a great way to connect with people in all different time zones, countries, cultures, and, uh, and be one. And that punctuates more than anything, the power of, of Rotary. So as I was mentioning, so we, we've got this unprecedented time and, and this flexibility to do Rotary the way that we want it. We've relaxed our attendance uh, requirements to now um, uh, you have to attend two meetings in, in a month. But what's more important than the actual attendance requirement is the kind of things that we can count as attendance. And so, for example, if you were to do a, um, a community service project, would that count as a meeting? Absolutely. How about, a, how about a committee meeting that you sit in on during the course of a month? Would that count? Absolutely. We have to recognize that we're busy, busy people and that an eclectic array of how we do service is very, very valuable. And this is important information for clubs to understand um, because, you know, we, we don't need secretaries and treasurers who are saying, you've missed a week, John, we, or three weeks, we can no longer have you in the club. And that's, that's not the kind of, um, it's not the kind of rotary that, that we are anymore. So that's one of the big things that, uh, that changed in, in this council, giving us the freedom to do Rotary the way that it best suits us and with guidelines. And one of the things that's most notable about that is that just because we've been given ultimate flexibility, it doesn't mean that we get rid of the things that are most significant and most important to us. Our core values, our motto of service above self, the object of Rotary, these things are fundamental to who we are. Those things don't change. They don't go out of style or out of fashion. And so we, re we remain committed to high ethical standards and to being the kind of civic leaders who do the right thing when no one's looking. And so, you know, we've, we've, we're changing, 
but uh, it's with guardrails. And I think that that's, I think that that's a significant thing. And one of the things that I think is kind of cool out of all of this is that really what we've done and what this council did was catch up with what the Rotary world is already doing. A lot of clubs have already said, you know what, we want to do business differently. We want to do it in a way that, that is more meaningful to us. My husband's club is a prime example. They uh, had a dwindling membership and uh, took a good look at themselves to see, you know, are we attractive? Are we attractive to someone who wants to join us? Are we selling what people want to buy? And they realized that they weren't. And so they changed to a meeting structure where they have four different kinds of meetings in a month. One, they have a regular club meeting with a speaker. One, they have a social. One week, they have a club assembly to discuss their, their upcoming projects and programs. And then one week, they have a service project. So which of those four meetings do you think have the best attendance? The social and the service project. No surprise. And you know what? It's interesting because we've done an abundance of research to, um, in particular, study our brand and to see, you know, how we can be as relevant as possible in our second century of service. And one of the things that came out of that was um, some research that we did to say, why do people join Rotary? And then why do they stay? And if you were to look at the, the reasons, and there's many, but the two top reasons why people join Rotary is first for service and second for fellowship or friendship. And then if you ask the same question, why do people stay, it just inverts a little bit. But friendship and fellowship becomes just a smidge more important and then service follows directly behind. So we know these are the things that fill our hearts, our souls, and it's why we're members of a Rotary Club, to do things that are good in our own community and our global community, however that means something to you. So, so we did all of this research over uh, the course of a couple of years, and many of you will recognize that we have our new Rotary brand. Um, one of the things that came out of that that was most significant, and I wish I had a a sample of it, you'll all recognize what I'm speaking of, is we took the Rotary logo and we pulled out our first name out of Rotary International and placed it next to the wheel. So now when you see our logo, it's what we call our Rotary signature, you see the word Rotary and then you see the wheel with it. The reason for doing that was that when we tested the um, globally the recognition of our wheel, we weren't getting full credit for, for, for what we do and, and full recognition for who we are as an organization. So pulling our first name out and putting it in there next to the wheel, now when people see the rotary wheel, there's no um, surprise about who we are or what we are as an organization. They can see that that wheel is indeed rotary. And you know, I liken it to an example, a uh, current example in, in sort of pop, culture and that's the the icon of Starbucks and if you think about the Starbucks icon forever it said Starbucks and then it had that image of a sort of a woman um, next to it well recently they've gone through pulling their name away and the icon stands on its own because they've built a strong brand one's the one that's recognized globally and when people see that iconic woman they know exactly what the promise is. They know exactly what's being delivered. And so at one point in time in, the, in, in our future history, I hope that we're able to take our name back off of that. But in the meantime, we need to build that strong recognition for who we are as an organization. So as part of this research, we also had um, three key findings that I think are absolute game changers for our organization. The, the very first is that we are leaders, every one of us, by mindset, by the way that we think. And this is really important. It's by the way we think, not necessarily by title. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we're going to attract younger members into our organization, are they the CEOs and the captains of industry in their own um, environments at any given time? No, they're not. They're not yet. But are they leaders? Absolutely. And do we want young leaders in our organization? Absolutely. But more important than that, 
and this is what I, I feel to the core of my being, we want young thinkers, young thinkers that are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. It's about the way we think. That's who we are as, as leaders in this organization. And I like to think that we're young, contemporary, hip, cool, and relevant thinkers. That's, that's what I like to think of us as. The second of our uh, key findings is that we're all about connections, connectivity. And it is that, that, that connectivity that, is, that makes us special. It's the enduring connections that we make with each other, the relationships that we form with each other. That, you know, you look at, for example, as I mentioned, you know, looking at the screen, I see faces of people who I've spent time with many, many days and, and hours of time. Herbert, you know, certainly mentioned the time that we spent in Evanston together. My good friend Lena from Norway is on, on the call with us, and we've spent countless days together. Tony, we've been training leaders together. Um, it's, it's, it's these kind of connections that all of a sudden, Amanda, we just spent last weekend together. You know, we, we, we're so fortunate in this organization that, you know what, our community is not just our own space around us. Rotary provides a global community. Um, a, couple of, a couple of weeks ago, I was at another training uh, conference in, um, in Stockholm. And uh, Lena, who I mentioned was on the call, was there, and we had a chance to hang out uh, for a couple of days. And while we were there, there was a, a, a young rotor actor, about 29 years old, great gal. Her and another young man were there, and they were participating in the entire event and adding a lot of really good energy and uh, working with some of the youth that were in attendance. The young woman, her name uh, was Sis, and she's from uh, Stockholm. And on the final morning that, that uh, everyone was presenting and, and giving some concluding remarks, she was asked, why Rotary? Why Rotary for her? And she said, if you want to join a big organization, join Facebook. If you want to join a quality organization, you join Rotary. I think that that's really cool. And she hit the nail on the head. I believe that that's um, who we are. We are the original social network. And uh, we are a quality network of, of individuals of all cultures, occupations, and cultures. And that's what differentiates us from other organizations. It's what makes us different. It's what makes us special. Um, the final of the three key findings is that we are community service scaled globally. Now, I think this is another big game changer because, you know, many times I've, I've run into people who have um, laid claim in their club. You know, we're a club who is very much focused on our community and that's, that's what we do. And then I, I run into another club who says, you know what, we're really focused on international service and this is where we hang our hat and this is what we do. Both are right. But the reality is, Rotary, as I mentioned earlier, is a community. We just have the ability to scale globally. So Rotary is our community. It's not about whether we do international or local work. It's that we have that ability through the power of one to dream, to come up with an idea, and then take it and launch it and, and reach out on a call such as this tonight and say, I have this idea. What do you all think? Can we do something about it? Can we make a change? And then we have the ability, because we're leaders, to take action. And that's the final point that I want to share with you, is that out of all of the research that we did, we concluded by creating what we call our essence statement, or our brand promise. And these are six key words that are fundamental to how we move the organization forward. And those words you'll likely recognize, and it's that we join leaders, we exchange ideas, and we take action. Now, this is, how, this is how we now differentiate ourselves. We join leaders, we bring together leaders from, as I said, all cultures, occupations, and cultures. And what do you do when you bring leaders together? You exchange ideas. You talk about things. You talk about how you can make things different. And because we are smart people, then we're compelled to take action. That's pretty cool. And you know what? That becomes a bit of what we call our, our elevator speech, if you will. When someone asks you, 
you know, what is Rotary? The inevitable question that, uh, that we get, and I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, that is a way to frame our organization. Not that you just need to tell them six words, but you, can, you could do it from the perspective perhaps of Rotary is an organization that joins leaders together and we get together on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to talk about some of the most pressing challenges in our community. For my club, we actually like to work on creating food baskets for the needy in our community. And you know what? We get together on a Saturday and we take action by creating these and getting them out into the community. So you could personalize this to, to whatever is meaningful for your experience in Rotary. But if we start all singing off of the same song sheet, so that there's a a united message that we all send, our brand will become stronger. And people will have us top of mind every time the word rotary is spoken out loud. So what are we doing about it next? Well, the next step that we're working on within um, the highest levels of our organization is a new strategic planning committee that's looking at what what comes next? What is our next? We have, we have our current strategic plan that focuses on foundation and membership and public image. And this has been critical to how we've taken the organization forward um, over the past probably decade or so. But you know, like all of us in our own businesses, um, you need to take a look at your strategic plan from time to time and, and realize, is it the right model? Is it up to date? Um, is it current? And the reality is we are living, as I started in the very beginning by saying, in unprecedented times. We are on the brink, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, of eradicating the disease of polio off the face of the earth. Every single one of us has had an opportunity to play a role in that, albeit either big or small. And as many of you will know, when we started this journey um, you know, more than 30 years ago, there were 350,000 cases per year of polio in the world. Today, 34. We have never been closer to the finish line, and we truly are going to cross the finish line. And Rotarians, you might not know these numbers, but they're huge. Rotarians have raised over $1.6 billion for polio eradication and immunized 2.5 billion children for this disease. We have worked tirelessly with our partners and it, it, it's taken a little bit longer than, than it was thought to take. But you know what? One of the things that we also know about Rotarians is that we persevere and we have tenacity and we will not walk away without this getting done and we will keep our promise to the children of the world to ensure that this disease is gone forever. There are many people working tirelessly on this and I'm Sure that some of you have had an opportunity to perhaps participate in an NID, a National Immunization Day, or even have had a chance to just um, simply raise pennies for polio or different, different kinds of fundraisers. I had an opportunity uh, two weeks ago to participate in a very interesting and creative um, polio fundraiser called Miles to End Polio. And this is a race that goes on in Tucson, Arizona, and it's called the El Tour de Tucson. And Rotary has had a team for about the past five years now, uh, really spearheaded by our General Secretary, John Huco. And he's a very avid cyclist and is incredibly, incredibly talented in this capacity. I, on the other hand, um, love to cycle, but um, perhaps shorter distances than he, than he likes to cycle. The full race was 106 miles. And... Um, I will confess, now there, were, there was a 106, um, uh, that was the full race, and then there was a 75 mile, a 55 mile, and a 28 mile. And with very little time to train, meaning twice, um, I, I decided to do the 28 mile leg. However, I took the opportunity to reach out to the Rotarians in the areas that I represent, um, even though I'm in Canada, I... I geographically oversee a, 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 essentially the upper third of the United States from a, from a governance perspective um, as a board member. And so I reached out and I challenged them to come up with funds um, to support me in this ride. And they came up with $468,000. 
US dollars. Now you think of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation match, and that's just shy of $1.4 million. I'll tell you, this ride started mid at midday in Tucson in the heat of the day. You can imagine, it's very warm. It was, uh, that leg was uphill and into the wind. Um, even when it was downhill, it felt uphill. <laughs> And um, it was hard. It was really hard. And every single time that I wanted to give up and throw in the towel, I just kept thinking of all of these folks who worked tirelessly to, to you know, raise these funds. And I also kept thinking that I actually get to ride a bike so that someone can walk. How cool is that? And so I was the last of the Rotarian team members, not the last of the 9,000. There were several hundred that came in behind me, um, the last of our Rotary team. But we had a great time. And I'm sure that many of you have seen uh, some of the cycling pictures, if you've uh, seen them in, in some of the magazines and, and uh, online. But it was a great opportunity to, to play a role in, in what this disease is what's happening with this disease and that it is truly going to be gone in some, some short given time. But I brought that up because, you know, what we're, where we're at right now is we have to think of what's our world look like, what's our rotary world look like in a post-polio world. And, you know, we will not stray one second from saying that our largest corporate initiative is the eradication of, of polio. But if we don't ha start having a dialogue now, not about what is next, but how do we even have the conversation? What are the things that we need to be talking about? Do we need to be talking with our partners, with Rotarians? Where, you know, what's happening with our areas of focus and where, where are Rotarians putting their time and their energy and their money? What, what's, you know, what are the things that we need to measure in order to take a next step? And I don't have an answer for you because um, quite candidly, there isn't one. And so we have a, a newly comprised strategic planning committee that is looking at some of these, uh, some of these things and looking at where do we go next um, as an organization, not necessarily from a, a corporate project priority, but, but where do we go next just fundamentally? What, you know, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about to remain as relevant as we can um, as we go into, as I said, our second century of service. So I, um, I'm a storyteller, and uh, I, I love to tell stories. I think it's one of the ways that we connect best with people about our organization. And, you know, every one of us has a rotary story to tell. And when we tell those stories, people understand and they see into what it is that we do, and, and I think it helps us to connect. So I want to um, before starting and opening up to questions, I just want to finish with a favorite story that I like to tell. And it's one about a time while I was serving as district governor in 2007, 2008. And I had, um, I live in Canada, but I'm in an international district. And so our district at that point in time had 50 clubs on the U.S. side. And then the Detroit River splits between Detroit and Windsor, where I live. And then we had 12 clubs on the Canadian side. So as a governor living in Canada, I had to travel across to the United States hundreds of times in the course of a year to go and visit my clubs and participate with them in their fundraisers and their programs and their social activities and, and uh, my official visits, etc. And so it was one day that I pulled up to the customs booth and there was an officer there who was not having a good day. And he had a very stern look on his face and he had his arms crossed and he barked at me and he said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to a rotary meeting. And he said, rotary? What's rotary? And so I was perhaps a little cheeky when I asked him if he wanted to hear the long version or the short version. And he said, just tell me what it is. And so I told him. I told him about the fact that we were 1.2 million men and women united under the motto of service above self, doing good work in our own community and beyond. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, he barked again, what do you really do? And so I told him about my own club and our, our, our local fundraisers and our projects and programs and our passions. And he started to lean in a little more. And he said, what else do you do? So I told him about clean water and health and hunger and literacy 
And then I told him about polio. Polio? Polio's gone, he said. And he continued to lean in more. And I said, yes, sir, polio is gone from many parts of the world, but it remains endemic. At that point, four countries. Now we know three. And Rotarians are working tirelessly to eradicate this disease off the face of the planet. And he said, well, what are you going to do about AIDS? And I said, sir, there's many Rotarians who are working on projects for AIDS and tuberculosis and malaria and so much more. And then he paused and he said, you mean to tell me there are that many people in the world with that much extra time on their hands? I said, no, sir. There are that many people in the world with no time on their hands that are committed to doing the good work of Rotary. And then he said, with tears forming in his eyes, you have made my day. And I said, no, sir, it's you that has made mine. And then he said, please thank the people. Please thank the people. And so I carry his message here to you today to say thank you. Thank you for all that you are doing. Thank you for all that you are going to do. And thank you for being leaders in our organization, for gathering at a meeting like this today and being able to share fellowship with me. This has been a true honor and a true privilege. And I'd love to open the